Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Han, Mr. President, distinguished ambassadors, the students. This is my first time in South Korea. I am deeply impressed by what I have seen. Korea has suffered really from many difficulties. From occupation, from poverty, from division, from lack of democracy. And in a rather short while, Korea gained independence the same year that Israel did, 1948. In 17 short years, Korea escaped the verdict of poverty, going well from an income per capita of $800 to $11,000, and Korea has enjoyed free elections, electing a civilian head, and if I may predict that in not a very long time, maybe 5 or 10 years, Korea will be reunited again as one nation. Korea doesn't have much land, so whatever Korea has achieved should be attributed to the Korean people. It is a result of your own provide and effort, and that is what has impressed me so much. I'm going to speak not about Korea. I'm going to speak about the world and Israel. But the Korean ambassador in Israel has translated to the Korean language the writings of one of our rabbis who gives some advice about world affairs, and I would like to quote from it. What I really wanted to say is that more than the world is a global village, the world is a global bridge that all of us are crossing day and night in many ways. The awakening of East Asia and the collapse of communism may be the two most important dramatic events in the last 10 or 20 years in world history. No longer is the world divided ideologically between East and West, or communism and democracy, nor is the world divided between North and South economically, because the ongoing story has been that the North is made up of rich people, basically white, and the South is made up of backward people, basically colored. Russia is no longer communist, looking for new destinies and ways, so the world is no longer really divided in the old terms between left and right. And with the awakening of Asia, with the emerging of countries like Korea or Singapore or Thailand or Indonesia, not to speak about Japan and China and India, we can see that it does not matter where you live, in the north or in the south. It doesn't matter what color your skin is, if you adopt the right economy. If you invest enough in education, as Korea has done, you can become rich and advanced without any reference to your location or to your race. The collapse of communism was not anticipated. It came as a total surprise. I have in my own library quite a collection of books about communism, which was considered to be the most brilliant literature in political terms. Now I have organized my library again and thrown away all the books on communism because I came to the conclusion that all those brilliant authors did not forecast what may happen in Russia. And today, I believe they didn't understand what did happen there. They were too sophisticated to understand the reality of time. One asks, why did communism fall? No foreign army has invaded Russia. Communism didn't fall because there was international pressure. Communism didn't fall because there was another revolution in Russia. Communism failed to quote Gorbachev in his memoir because only communists could have brought down the communist system. I believe communism failed because the Russian people and the young Russian generation began to ask the question, why is there freedom and affluence in other countries and not in Russia? Actually, I believe what emerged is that the silver curtain of television overpowered the iron curtain of dictatorship. And one must say in favor of Mr. Gorbachev that he was the first communist leader that did not blame the shortages, the shortcomings of communism, on his predecessors. Rather, he accused the system itself. He says, we cannot accuse the people who are dead. We have to change the system which is alive. So what went wrong with the system Gorbachev accused? 
The basic answer is that there is a much deeper change than all of us realize. Personally, I do believe that going over from the 20th century to the 21st century is not a chronological development, but a sea change in world history in human development. What has changed basically is that the sources of wealth and the sources of strength are no longer material, but really intellectual. I mean today, what makes a country great or small, rich or poor, strong or weak, is not the size of the land, not the wealth of the natural resources, nor the number of people, but really the adaptation of science, of technology, the investment in education, the investment in research and development, the employment of up-to-date information, and basically the education of the people. Japan is smaller in land than Russia. Japan doesn't have the natural resources that Russia has. Japan doesn't have water or gold or silver or oil. And yet, Japan became a great economic power and Russia suffers from economic shortcomings. Furthermore, you cannot accuse the Russian people because the Russian people are an extremely intelligent people. The great story of Russia is the contradiction between the intelligence of the people and the lack of intelligence of the system. As an Israeli, I compare my country to Japan and to Russia. Japan is 15 times the size of Israel, and Russia, the former Soviet Union, is 1,000 times the size of Israel. Israel is one-fourth of Korea. You have 100,000 square kilometers. We have 24,000 square kilometers. And the Soviet Union used to be 24 million square kilometers. The former Soviet Union had much more water than we have. Russia has 3 million lakes. Israel has 2 lakes, 1 dead. Russia has 100,000 rivers, 12 among them the largest in the world. The Don, the Dnieper, the Volga. Israel has one river, the Jordan River, which has more history than water. Yet Israel has a surplus of food, and Russia has a shortage of food. When Russia renewed diplomatic relations with Israel, the first thing it bought from Israel were cows. Why cows? Because the Israeli cow produces three times as much milk as a Russian cow. Now it is the same cow, the same horse. The difference is not in the animals. The difference is in the system. And the moral of the story is that you can have more milk from the system than you have from the cows. And the difference again is that science, technology, information, and education do not have borders, do not have distances, do not make differences. Science can go from one place to another place without a passport. Technology can travel without a visa. And information is blowing like the wind. Nobody can really stop it. So we are beginning to live in a world that has very little borders and very few distances and disappearing differences. But not only are the opportunities without borders or distances, so are the dangers. The dangers, too, are not very much impressed by borders or distances. A missile can fly over frontiers and fortifications, mountains and deserts and rivers. It does not stop. Today, the dangers are ballistic rather than geographic. It's not only danger, not only missiles. The same goes for terror, for reactionary movements like fundamentalism. It goes for non-conventional weapons, for rocks. Actually, we are moving from a world of enemies to a world of dangers. An enemy has a land, a border, an army, a flag. Dangers don't have armies, don't have land, don't have borders. They can appear in every place and you never know from where they came. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States lost its enemy. And poor Mr. Clinton, he didn't know what to do. Because if you lose an enemy, how can you conduct a foreign policy? When you go to the Congress, and you ask for money, they say, what for? Who is your enemy? 
It's only South Korea that has a clear enemy, North Korea, but many other countries don't have an enemy anymore. Both Russia and the United States have discovered that when you lose your enemy, you're not free of problems. Dangers may be more complicated than enemies. And they have discovered that all of us live in a world that was organized to fight or defend one's land against enemies. We were organized to take our wealth from our land. We had neither concepts, nor strategies, nor coalitions to face the new opportunities and the new dangers. The world has changed, not our minds. Because people prefer to remember rather than to think or rather than to change, so unfortunately, we live with old minds in a new world. With the end of the Cold War, there were also changes in different regions, including the Middle East, because the regional conflicts were making a living on the world conflict. The Russians and the Americans supported different sides in different conflicts, but once the conflict between Russia and America was over, there was nobody to pay for the local conflicts, and the local conflicts lost their real income. The same thing happened in the Middle East. We came to the conclusion that there is no sense in continuing the wars of yesterday instead of facing the dangers of today. If we look today at the Middle East and ask ourselves what are the greatest dangers, I would say, first of all, the fundamentalist movement, which is trying to win over the Muslim world, 1 billion, 300 million people strong present on every continent and in every place, trying to use terror, trying to take over other countries, including the oil-producing countries, trying to build a nuclear option, trying to buy missiles from North Korea. So again, the danger they create is not necessarily just to their neighbors. The danger they create is to Asia and America and Europe. Because if Iran, for example, has a nuclear bomb and continues with the spread of fundamentalism and tries to take over oil-producing countries in the Middle East, they can play with the economies of Asia, of Europe, and of America. I think this is the greatest danger of our time. And it is not only dangerous to Israel, it is as dangerous to the Arab countries. Many of the Arab leaders would not like to see their country or their religion submitting to the fundamentalist whim. If you were to hear President Mubarak or King Hussein or Chairman Arafat speaking about fundamentalism, they would use the same language that we are using. So maybe we have to get rid of the old animosities, of the old skirmishes, of the old wars, and build a new strategy and a new coalition to enable our own children to enter a new age without the danger of fundamentalism or terror or nuclear threat. The late Prime Minister Isaac Rabin and I decided to use our age, our experience, and our prestige to make the difficult decisions and try to turn enemies of yesterday into partners of today, hostilities of the past into opportunities of the future. In spite of the fact that many of our people were not prepared for this, but we felt that it was our duty to take all the necessary risks to enable a younger generation to enter a new page in history free of the old dilemmas and the old wars. It is not simple, because the Palestinians, the PLO, were very much hated in Israel. So was Mr. Arafat and just meeting with him was a great problem for us. I don't know if you saw on television our agreement being signed on the lawn of the White House. When Mr. Rabin had to shake the hand of Mr. Arafat, his body language was terrible. He didn't like it. And after he signed the agreement, he turned to me and whispered in my ear, Now it's your turn. You have to do it. When you are at war or have a division, Every nation is having a dialogue with its own self. You don't have a dialogue with the other party. And when you conduct a dialogue with your own self, you're very brilliant. It is only when you meet the other party 
that you discover that brilliance is not enough. And then when you meet the other party, you discover that the other party has hopes and reason and demands. And if you want to make peace, you have to make compromises and you have to make concessions. And when you make concessions and compromises, your own people begin to ask you, what are you doing? Why do you give back land? Why do you give back authority? Why do you behave nicely to your former enemy? Because the raw material of partners are your former enemies. So making peace is not singing a song. It is a very, very difficult experience. The last year for me was one of the saddest years in my life. Because if you sing a song, you have a concert. But when you make peace, you have a controversy. The year started with the assassination of Mr. Rabin before my eyes. The assassin didn't know whom to kill first, Mr. Rabin or me. We had had a very large rally in Tel Aviv. The reason was because Mr. Rabin thought that we had lost the support of the people and we wanted to see if we were still enjoying it. And to the rally came hundreds of thousands of people. We drew tremendous support, many of them young and sincere and enthusiastic. They were singing songs, they were supporting peace, they were praising Mr. Rabin, they were supporting the two of us. And it came out that this was the happiest day in the life of Mr. Rabin. I knew Rabin. We had worked together for 40 years. I had never seen him singing in his life. That night, Mr. Rabin, a singer, and I were standing and singing a song of peace and since neither Mr. Rabin nor I was a very great singer, we got a piece of paper with the words of the song. And Mr. Rabin read the paper, sang it, and then he folded it and he put it in his jacket. And three minutes later, the song of peace and his heart were penetrated by three bullets. Rabin was assassinated at a quarter to ten. And four hours later, I had to take over a confused, embarrassed, crying nation. People full of tears and disappointment and worries and nobody really knew what to do. I thought to myself that clearly my first task was to bring the people together and stop all the different wars and accusations. But I knew that my real task was to implement the second part of the Oslo Agreement which was more complicated because we had to withdraw our army from the holy parts of our country in the face of great criticism and great resentment. Well, I thought that we shall have a better reaction from the part of the Arab side, but instead, a terror started to show itself in the heart of Israel with one bomb in Jerusalem. I woke up in the morning at 6 o'clock. Instead of going to my office, I went to the center square of Jerusalem to see the square full of blood. Many people killed. Many people injured. Thousands of people standing in the square, crying and shouting at me as they had done against Rabin. Traitor! Killer! What did you do? I stood silent. I couldn't say a word. The next morning at 6 o'clock, again, instead of going to my office, my security people told me there was another bomb in another square in Jerusalem. And again, I went to the other square. Again, blood, injured people, dead people, their relatives standing around with tears in their eyes, and again, thousands and thousands of people shouting the same cry, Killer! Murderer! What did you do? Then came a third day, and this time the bomb in the bus was not in Jerusalem, but in Tel Aviv. More people killed, more people crying, more blood. Again, me standing in the middle, and I couldn't say a word. I could only cry with the people. And then came a fourth day, in another place of Israel, in Ashkelon. The same story. And I knew that we had lost the elections. Is that a happy experience? No. 
Then the terror stopped in the heart of the country, and they started to shoot missiles, katushas from Lebanon to Israel. And again, the whole population of the northern part of our country went to shelters during the holy days of Passover. Seven days and seven nights, and many people said, What are you doing? You are in charge. I tried to stop it by diplomatic means, but it didn't help. And then came the elections, and we lost the election by one third of a percent. The difference between the other party and ourselves was only 15,000 votes. But the other party said, we can do peace better and cheaper than Mr. Paris. We can do peace slower. We can do peace without bombs, without terror, without missiles. And many people said, why not? Let's try it. And that was, in my judgment, one of the reasons why we lost the elections. Was that a happy year? No. Was that a sad experience? Yes. Do I regret it? No. That which we have had to do, to tell the truth to our people, to make the difficult decisions, the most important of which was the moral one. Namely, we didn't want to become forever the occupier of another people, of the Palestinians. And so nobody threatened us. Nobody pressed upon us. We ourselves decided to give the Palestinians their own right to run their own lives. Can they make peace without a price? No. Can they make peace without terror? No. Can they make peace slower? No. Can they make peace? This became a question. Yet peace gained a personality of its own. It gained a strength of its own. We are not again going to control the Palestinians. And many Arabs, like ourselves, have tasted the taste of peace. And there is already real support for peace, for its own dynamism. I do not believe that governments or parties leaders or ministers can really stop the march of history. And to conclude my remarks, I would like to emphasize what are, in my judgment, the real lessons from it. Number one, I think the age of the sword, the age of the war, is over. Today, if people want to become strong and rich, they have to go to the schools and not to the military camps. It is education and science and technology and information that really make the world a more promising place to live in. So we are moving from a world of domination to a world of creation, of competition. I think if today, for example, Mr. Disraeli were to go to Queen Victoria and offer her a new empire, Bangladesh or Pakistan or Ghana, I'm sure she would throw him out of the room and say, Would you have a new internet? Would you have a new electronic device? Because that is what makes people strong today. And very much because of that reason, I'm optimistic enough to believe that the Cold War will not return. And the third lesson is, when you are thinking about politics or strategy, Never forget that the highest degree of political or strategic wisdom is the moral call. Don't be occupiers. Don't be dominators. Enable people to live in a pluralistic society because democracy is two things, not one thing. The two things are, one, the right of every person to be equal, and two, the equal right of every person to be different. And then for us, the older generations, we have to put an end to the old wars and hatred and understand that it is a world without borders, so it is also a world without differences. And to you students, don't listen to what we say. Don't take the books of history too seriously, because the future is not a continuation of the past, but a reference to the future. Better invest all your talents to learn how to learn instead of learning how to know, because everything we know is changing 
and becoming obsolete. So we have to develop the personality that will enable us all our lives to learn anew. My own mentor was the founder of Israel, Mr. David Ben-Gurion, with whom I worked for 18 years. And he always told me, all experts are for things that did happen. You don't have an expert for things that may happen. So my advice to you is to learn and learn how to learn because you are entering a world of great competition, of great creativity, of many changes. If you do so, you will make Korea maybe not greater in land, but greater in prosperity and hope and peace. It is possible today in spite of all the costs and all the achievements. So let's pay the price of peace instead of carrying the cost of war. If you shall pay the price of peace, you, the younger people, will be entitled to live in a better and a different world. Thank you.